Okay, welcome back. Uh, just a reminder for all the students uh, online to ensure that you finish your assessment by the end of next week, so that because these count for your final grades. Also, the e-learning students also um, both the assessments to be completed by the 26th of April, so that you have access to your certificates. Okay. So quickly, let's do a recap. What were the ethical considerations? Francis, seven. You'd like to share? You can look and tell. Uh, first one is compassion. OK. Uh, second one is uh, competent. Um, mm. uh, third one is consent. Fourth one is confidence. Confidentiality. Uh, fifth one is cultural regard. Uh, sixth one is uh, colleague, collegiality. And seventh one is community presence. Very good. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> OK, very good. Francis attended the class. OK. OK, the last that we're going to be looking at is boundaries. OK, what are some boundaries that we have to maintain? So when what, what do you what's the meaning of boundaries? Something that indicates a certain limit, OK, a limit or a or a border. And why is it needed for us to have a professional boundary or what is a professional boundary? It's that framework that we work within that make our relationships safe and also have limits for how we may deliver some of our services. OK? So what is the uh, need? It is something that helps you build your own personal identity over, some, over a point of time. Um, OK, sorry, did, did I? OK, so what does that mean? One is it helps you to understand your own roles and responsibilities. That's what we mean by having a sense of personal identity. As a counselor, what are your roles and responsibilities that you need to give out? How do you conduct yourself within those roles and responsibilities? OK, um, now, no matter what is going on, that is, even if there are emotional ups and downs or any kind of pressure that is there on the outside, you continue maintaining those the way that you work, right? Your the responsibility that you have a, as a counselor. So you don't lose yourself, let's say, in a counseling relationship, or you are you you don't you shouldn't be over involving yourself because you think that will increase the well-being of your counseling okay you got that you you don't lose yourself in such a way that you know you're worrying about them and you're so burdened and you know you lose sleep neither are you so over involved that because you think that only if you do that will the counseling be well okay so there are certain identities, certain practices that you as a counselor needs to maintain. And that's why these boundaries are, uh, are there. So you're the one who sets those boundaries. And you're the one who manages those boundaries. Like, for example, in counseling, someone comes to you and says, oh, you're just like my son. OK? Or you're just like my daughter. Or you're just like my father. You're just like my mother. So who sets those boundaries? Who's the one who should be setting that boundary? You are the one who's setting the boundary, right? Your counselee may come and say, you're, you're just like my son, and may come in and you know, probably bring you food or bring you, let's say, you know, come and give you a hug and call you in the night. And you know, all of that, that's where you establish some of those boundaries. It's important to manage some of those boundaries okay yeah so that's what it means by the line between the self of the counselee and the self of the counselor there is that firm boundary line that should be maintained just like how you would do in any 
professional setting, right? Like even in college, even as you are in college, there's a certain boundary that you maintain, right? You may, yes, discuss personal things, but still there is a, the boundary line is, is always, is to be maintained. Did I come off the screen? Or you are able to see? You are able to see the presentation? Okay, sorry, I can't see it. I'm just going to share it again. Okay. All right. So now, why is it important that we talk about these boundaries is because we have the ability to better recognize boundary issues as they arise. I'll, I'll give you examples and you will understand that. Because if you don't know, like, for example, one of the boundaries is you never counsel a family member. Your husband, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, you don't counsel them. So when you know about these boundaries, you're able to recognize them when they arise. So when someone says, some family member comes to you and says, you've done Christian counseling, no, come and counsel me. You know that it's a boundary, that it's best not to counsel someone who's a family member. All right? Uh, boundaries help you clarify ethical expectations. It, it tells you, like we spoke about those seven ethics. It helps you clarify that, right? Like when it means confidentiality or when it means uh, competence or being collegiality, you know where it is that you have to place that boundary. It's important to talk about boundaries because you have a clear idea of where your boundaries are. Because unless we specify something, we don't know whether it's right or wrong. And you also have a plan of action in case those boundaries are mismanaged or they are violated. You know what to do if those boundaries are mismanaged. Okay. Boundaries also reduce the risk of counseling exploitation. For example, you're a counselor, someone's come to you, and you have fallen in love with your counseling. OK? Now, that has happened. Many times that's happened. When you fall in love with your counseling, or you, know, you do some favors for them because they remind you of your, maybe your son, your daughter, or whatever. Right? So it reduces, when there are these boundaries, you, it reduces the risk that you are exploiting somebody. Like, like for example, maybe the counselee is your neighbor. Um, you are coming for counseling, no? So just take, give me a ride also. Right? So that's what we mean by ri risk of counselee exploitation. You're not using your counselee for your... roles that are very clear. Maybe communication is happens only on a face-to-face, -face, or if it's on a phone, it will be a five-minute call. The rest of it will be, um, you know, in a conversation, or, uh, you know, we th there aren't, you know, we don't visit each other's homes. All of that, there are certain rules and roles that are identified, okay? It also increases the well-being of the counselor. You do not have to be afraid to draw those boundaries right in order to feel good or be nice you you must um, ensure that your well-being is protected and lastly it actually provides a role model for counselees when you are when you have certain boundaries it actually teaches your counselees also to maintain some boundaries that are needed okay okay we look at um, okay who negotiates the boundaries it is you as a counselor. It's your duty to negotiate it. And you are the one who is ultimately responsible for also managing those boundary issues. Right? You can't say, you know, the counselee, uh, like for example, as I said, the counselee has fallen in love with me. I can't do anything. She's the one who brings cake and I take it. I don't have anything, but then I take it. But then the fact is that you've taken it, right? So you're the one who are responsible to manage that. And uh, it give, 
you should have a clear understanding of ethics and boundaries. OK, so what are clear boundary areas? You generally don't plan social activities with your counselors. Going for lunch, going for dinner, those aren't uh, very helpful. Now, you may be thinking, how is this practical in a church setting? I'll come to that a little later, OK? Having sex with your counselors or having family members or friends as counselors. All of this are very, very clear boundary areas. You hear? OK. A counselee should not be your lover, your relative, your employee, your employer, your instructor, your business partner, your friend, anyone who you have personal relationships with. OK? No, no, you should not counsel. Yeah, your lover, your relative. Why? Uh, tell, uh, let's look at why. There's, a, there's an emotional connection you have with them. That's one. Secondly, you probably know a lot about them already. And you already have a bias. Yes? And so that bias is operational when you are counseling them. Isn't it? Right? So it's best not to, because we can't always be so aware that we are unbiased. So it's best not to. OK? So instructor, business partner, friend, all of this. Because you may know something about people that, that could be like a struggle in your own counseling session. OK? It's not that you can't marry your friend. That's not what I meant, OK? I hope that's clarified. It's you don't counsel them, OK? Which means, that means you have, you have married your counselee if, you, if they become your partner. Isn't it? Yeah, which you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> no, I didn't follow Anand. Once again? Yes, you should not. You should avoid not have a relationship with your counselee. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. So areas where boundaries may blur. OK, so what happened? You have a question? Ask. To you. So you say you don't want to counsel them. <laughs> That's that is your worry. <laughs> so you don't see if you now what I think what you're saying is you're a counselor, you like somebody and they've come to you for counseling. Right? Coincidence. Okay, whatever. I'll I'll come to that. I'll come to that. That's that's a slide I'll come to. Okay. This way talking about let's say those who are in a more professional kind of a setting. OK? All right. Now, remember that many boundary issues may not be that clear cut. And there may be certain blurring of it. And this can sometimes becoming a, uh, there can be a problem. But these are areas we need to be very careful about. Self-disclosure. How much you disclose to your counseling? Right? It's, it's a skill. It's something that you can do. But you have to be careful because it can create certain issues and problems. Second, giving or receiving gifts. 
like sometimes you know as as a counselor because I've, I've worked i've got gifts like people bring sweets so it it probably depends uh, on what kind of gift let's say it's an expensive gift i will refuse if it's something like sweets or so i'll say you know it may be good to give it to the office so that everyone can have so in that way what are you actually communicating to them yeah so you know there are some things if it's <laughs> or, or you're saying this is i mean i'm not personally uh what do you say personally um influenced by the gift okay but but then you can actually give it to the office if it's things like food or sweets chocolates say so give it to the office and you know let it it's it's fine right but if they're like say expensive gifts you can very clearly say we do not uh, entertain that okay now here dual or overlapping really yeah even there you've got to be very very careful because these are all blurred boundaries some are okay some aren't okay but you can't say okay because the last two people who bought me something was were you know it was a gratitude and this is not something else so that's why that's why we have these boundaries uh, or or you know you don't know when one something will slip so the best thing to do is to keep a standard practice that any gifting or any of that, like even when they do bring it, maybe initially, you, you know, you can refuse it. Okay. Uh, dual or overlapping relationships. Now, what is this dual? Now, this is this is where maybe we, uh, uh, like in a church where we have counselees, this is where this comes in. There are different kinds of relationships. Like for me, I have a lot of people that I meet on a Sunday morning. Right, I talk to as friends or not not as friends, but as acquaintances of people that I know as church members. But they may also come in for counseling. Okay, so these are what we call as dual or overlapping relationships. And this also has to we have to be very careful. But in a church setting, sometimes this is unavoidable. Right? It is unavoidable, unless, of course, the counselor is not part of the church and comes just to sit there. But there is another another part of it. Because people may know me as a, or know the counselor as a member of the church, they may not want to come to you also. Right? Because they fear that, you know, there'll be judgment or all of that. So we have both sides of it. But in a church setting, sometimes, like I said, it's unavoidable. And that's why we've got to be careful. Like even... Um, and, uh, you know, something that I keep in mind and I do very carefully is that let's say someone has spoken about something in a counseling room and I meet them in church. I will make sure that I don't talk about that there. I don't. All that is discussed only in the counseling room. Huh? Profession is profession. Yeah. So then here we talk about different things or, you know, whatever thing. But then if they bring us say, let's, we'll meet for a session or we'll talk at that time. Let's keep it to that. So I'm very, very sure that I do that. Okay. So that's what happens. Sometimes there is this kind of, it is inevitable in a setting like ours. Right. Okay. Becoming friends. Again, this you may like again in a church setting you may have started to counsel someone but then in time the person feels extremely friendly to you right and then maybe after a year they come to you and say i want counseling that time you can very clearly say you know our friendship has grown from where it was maybe you should probably meet somebody else okay or physical contact on the way any kind of physical proximity that may be there Okay, now what are the danger zones when you're looking at boundaries? What are danger zones? One is to over identify with the. You have a question, Francis? You have? No? Okay. Is over identifying with the counselee's issues? That is, let's suppose 
you have the same problem or you had the same problem as the counseling and you over identify with it so much so that you are so involved that they should sort it out in your pace in your time in the way that you have that's what is called as over identification Danger zones is when you have a strong attraction to the counseling. May not. No, no, not friend. This is counseling. A counselee who has a similar problem like you did or you do. And so you over identify with them and, and really, you know. Yeah. That it's it's almost become personal to you. Their problem has become personal to you. That's what that over identification is. Okay, strong attraction. Now this is not just romantic attraction. It can be any other thing. Like you know, you like the person's personality, or you know, like something about them. That can be a danger zone. Why? What would happen if you have a strong attraction to your counselling? Ah, uh, okay. Apart from that. Yeah, so we are not objective in our uh, questions or in the way that we help them. Yes, we become emotionally attached, yes. Spending time with the counselee outside of work or work area or sharing unnecessary personal information with the counselee. All right? Okay, what are we supposed to be doing? So certain do's and don'ts is to respect cultural differences. So do not use gestures, tone of voice, expressions, or any other behavior that a counselee should interpret as seductive, sexually demeaning, or sexually abusive. OK? So being very careful of how we do. Like, for example, <clears throat> in some cultures, you know, you looking at them at the eye like that is very suggestive looking into the eyes, staring into the eyes, not looking, staring into their eyes. Or let's say shaking a hand and continuously holding the hand can be suggestive. So being very clear that you do not do what you may understand may be culturally inappropriate. So maintain safe boundaries. Ah, no. Talk no, not that when you're actually probably staring at them or, you know, yeah, just, just just keep looking like that, you know, or, you know, looking at their body that way, all of that, right? No, not normal conversations, but something that seems more uncomfortable. Okay, not making comments about the counselee's body or clothing. All right, being careful. Do not engaging in inappropriate, affectionate behavior with a counselee, whatever that may be. OK, like uh, anything that you feel or sense that could be misunderstood or misconstrued. OK. Uh, do not talk about your own sexual preference, fantasies, or problems. These are all don'ts. Do not request a date with your counseling. Do not meet personal needs in other areas of your life. You're coming that way, please buy me one kg of potato and come. OK? So not getting your personal needs met. Uh, and ensure that you do maintain supervision or consultation relationships. That is, in case you have difficult counselees, it's always good to have someone like a supervisor to help you through that counseling process. OK? All right. Now, the rule of dual relationships, like I said, dual relationships are those where you as a counselor may have a multiple role. You may be a counselor, you may be a church member, you may be a, I don't know, life group member. There may be different roles that you are playing. This is when you have more than one role with your counselee. And these relationships can often blur those boundaries. Okay. And when these blurring happens is when uh, the roles become extremely confused. So that's why you've got to be extremely careful about how you relate with someone like that. If you do find that the relationship has become much more stronger, it's best to send them to somebody else. Give them, uh, ensure that they have 
um, that they see someone else. Okay. Uh, remember that not all counselee interactions are dual relationships. Like, for example, if you run into a counselee at a social event, right? You may be in a market or you may be in a wedding and you see that same person there. It's okay, right? Uh, or if your counselee is a waiter in your restaurant that you're going to, okay? The important thing at that point and, and what, I, what I think and what I feel is a good thing to do is like for example once I went to meet a friend in a hospital and one of the doctors in that hospital is my it's my counselor so I was sitting with the with my friend for coffee in the cafeteria and this doctor came and sat right opposite okay so I caught his attention I saw him he saw me but I didn't show as if I know him but he said Hi, and I said hi. So this friend asked me, "How do you know him?" I said, "I know him from from a, from another environment." That's what I said. But later, I called him and I told him the reason why I didn't acknowledge you was because of this. That you know, I don't want because people know that I'm a counselor, and those who may see me in a different environment may think that okay, maybe you've counselled that person. Why have they counselled? So then I called him and I told him the reason why I didn't acknowledge you was that I didn't want her to know or even un, even have the smallest inkling that you have come to me for help. So he said he understood and he appreciated that. So that's something that you can do, right? You don't you don't have to acknowledge them if they don't acknowledge you. And later because sometimes your counsellors will just pretend as if they don't know you. And that is because they don't want others to know that they are associated with you. All right. Like, for example, there are times that people don't come to the church office for counseling. They don't. So they either speak on the phone or we meet at another place because they don't want the rest of the. And it's so you respect that. Okay. So that's what that's what I meant by these these interactions sometimes may not always be dual. So how you participate in the interaction will determine the outcome. So what you do, how you participate really will, will be the way that they respond. Okay. Now, there is an exemption to this ethical code as pastors or pa unlicensed pastoral counselors by law or regulation are not typically required to hold the same standard of professional conduct as licensed counselors. Nevertheless, they recognize moral, ethical imperatives that may still exist as part of Christian ethics, which means as a pastor, you don't fall in love with your, maybe with your counselee or, you know, all of that. So there are those ethical uh, Christian ethics that you still hold, even though some of these rules or ethics may not be completely applicable for, for pastors. pastors. Like, no, like for example, um, no, no, not that you don't need to, like consent. You're not going to take a consent to every person who comes and talks to you as a pastor, right? You're not going to say, okay, give me a consent and write. You can't probably do that, right? You can't do that. Or let's say um, this collegiality, right? Now, maybe a pastor, the first interaction with them may not know what their background or what other uh, professionals they have seen, right? So because it's, it's their quick interactions, right? So they may pray for healing, right? All of that they may do. So some of this, they may not be as strong boundaries as the other one. But of course, competence. Um, uh, ensuring that you know you 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 uh, not violate the dignity. All of that are principles that we think. But so, like confidentiality, probably something that the wife is sharing. He may say, you know, please bring your husband in without a written consent. You get that? So some of these may not be completely applicable for them because they are. It is. It's a different role that a pastor is playing. Okay. All right. Okay. Any questions? Yes. 
So if a pastor who's done professional counseling generally will not give suggestions. So remember the role of a pastor and the role of a counselor are very different. Right? So you have to differentiate that when you're having the role of a pastor, you admonish, you correct, you know, you guide, you discipline. That's the role of a pastor who's a shepherd. Counseling, exactly. Right? So that's why if you look at it, you know, that that distinction. I know it's it's very very thin, but that distinction is is probably helpful. Like you know, this is coming coming as a pastor, and that's why a lot of places have counselors who will take care of other kind of issues. But as a pastor, that role is very very different. It's not a counseling role there. It's a role of a shepherd. Okay, all right. We're open to questions. We're officially done as of now, but open to questions. And one quest, first question comes from Francis. You had a question? Huh? You already asked. OK. Anybody else? Online students? Anyone? Speak into the mic, no? Can counseling be done in other places? If not in offices, it's like can uh, they like can a counselor meet or counsel you over coffee shop? Yeah, and have counseling sessions like that. They can do. So generally, professional counseling is done in a in a designated place, right? But like I said, it depends on what role you're playing. You know, if you have like, like, like for me, there are sometimes I've seen people at a coffee shop because they don't do not want to come to the office or they come to my house, so that there is a another place where there is anonymity. So, so it's mostly based on the counseling. Yeah, the counseling. So they may tell you, "I feel uncomfortable. Can we have it somewhere else?" So that's how and and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can keep that, you know, this is going to be one hour. We're going to be just talking about this. That boundary is something you can set prior itself. OK, any other questions? OK, I have a question. Has this made anyone in this group or the group here want to learn about counseling more? Oh, wow, I've got five here, or oh, six. The sixth one came later, but yeah. <laughs> what about in the group? Uh, in the, do you feel that you'd like to know counseling more? That would be a great thing. I think it's a job well done then. No response. OK. All right, OK, thank you all so much. Thank you for the last 15 weeks. For, for the for just learning through the entire course and pray that it's a blessing. You can use some of this even in your interactions with others. So let's just close with a word of prayer. And I'll ask Anand to close with prayer.